In 2009, 2010, I was living with my mother who had a hard time, almost almost deaf, couldn't see, and could barely walk. But she wanted to come to my sentencing, even though it was a five-hour ride one way, because she wanted to make a statement to the judge. Uh, she stood up and said to him, Your Honor, I'm going to read what she said. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I've suffered enough for a lifetime. My daughter, she's been a fantastic daughter. Without her, I can't exist. She's been doing everything for me. She feeds me, she shops, as far as I'm concerned, and she repeats herself. Without her, I can't exist, not even a day. I will die without her. To which the judge said, your daughter's a monster, and she's going away to prison for two years. Now, I was really pissed at this judge. Not because he hurt my feelings, but because he said this in front of my mother. My case was a tax case. I couldn't have possibly, he said I hurt hundreds of people. I either hurt all of America or no one, but I certainly didn't hurt hundreds of people on a tax case. Um, I went home and you unpack for prison. You put away your life. You take off your jewelry, you put away your pocketbook. You go to prison with the least amount of clothes possible. And as I was unpacking and making notes, uh, my mother and I, I was her 24-hour nurse. And I had no idea who was going to come the next day when I was going to prison. Um, she walked in with a walker. She used to be my height, which is short, five feet. She now shrunk to four foot nine. She's walking her walker. And she said, I want to talk to you. So I stood up. And she said, prison is going to be harder for you than concentration camp was for me. And I said, are you crazy? You are in Auschwitz. How could you compare the two? And she said, I was 12 years old. You're 60. And it wouldn't be for years later when I was in solitary confinement that her words would come back to me. She said, I was a child. I didn't know what was going on. You're an old woman. You're 60 years old. You're going to have the memory of everything you did in your life every day to think about. The minute you enter prison, you know you have left the free world. Um, they take you into um, a dark, dingy room. I think prisons are just dark, dingy, and cold and designed to be that way. And you have to strip in front of an officer. And then she forces you to be in front of her and then you have to lift your breasts so she can check underneath for paraphernalia. And then she makes you bend over and cough so she can check that you have no drugs or anything in your vagina or your anus. And at that moment, in that 10 seconds that you're bent over, you are the most humiliated that you've ever been in your entire life. And in that 10 seconds, you know that you have to take every emotion that you've ever felt and put it away, and you couldn't show that you wanted to cry, and you couldn't show that you wanted to respond. Um, and you had to develop a coping zone that you didn't even know if it existed in you in order to survive this place. And you know that in the first 10 seconds. And when I interview formerly incarcerated people, it's right at the beginning of the interview when I talk to them about the first day of prison that they say to me, to, when they talk about the strict search and say, um, I never wanted to come back to prison because I never wanted to do that again. Um, okay, then? Okay, put her on the stage. It's okay. um, I'm sorry. Give me one second. Oh, excuse me. I know what's wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Caught in her, um... okay. She got caught up in her laugh in there. Now it'll be a challenge to concentrate. Um, so after you get strip search, you're taken to a unit. Uh, most people go into a unit that's designed to give you a two-week um, kind of feel for the place where they talk to you. It's a, um, usually called an A&O a &O unit, admissions unit, and the veterans walk over to you and they say, if you want an easy time, the best thing that you can do 
is not be known by the captain, not be known by any officer. Um, just be quiet. Well, that lasted, I was a baby of the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement, I marched all my life, I was a radical activist, and there was no way I could leave that at the door. And so it took about an hour for me to be on literally everybody's radar. And this is how it happened. Um, you're allowed to bring 25 pictures into prison. And people walk over to you. So women were walking over to me and saying, are you married? And I'd say, no. Do you have kids? I'd say, no. And after about the fourth one said, are you married? No. Do you have kids? No. I finally said, well, I'm not going to go back. And I've been out for 40 years. I was 60 years old when I went to prison. I came out in my 20s. So I'm not going back in the closet. In fact, the first person I told was my mother, and she said to me, if Hitler didn't kill me, you will. Which I thought was the funniest thing in the world. And when she told it to me, I went like, you know, I couldn't stop that. I thought, that would be a great title of a book I'll write. <laughs> she was the most progressive woman I knew. And in one moment, she turned into Anna Tefka spitting on the floor at me. And it was a remarkable thing to see. Um, so, the next person that came over to me that said, are you married, do you have a kid? I said, I'm not married, uh, I don't have a kid, I'm a lesbian. And so the woman said to me, can I see your 25 pictures? I said, sure. Well, I had brought 25 pictures of Allie. So this young girl got up, this old white woman brought 25 pictures of her dog. Well, everybody, this 1,100 women, and by lunch, uh, inmate.com, which is the new version of the telephone, was all over campus. Everybody knew I was a lesbian. Everybody knew I only had pictures of my dog. And it put me in a very dangerous position that I had come out day one. Not that there weren't other people there. They just didn't talk about it. So it's the fact that I said it and used the word that was a problem. Um, so much for being under the radar. So about, uh, I would say, no less than 10 days later, the unit manager, who was a white woman, and by the way, this first unit was, most of the compound is black and brown, but this one unit was white, which I thought was pretty peculiar. So as new people came in who were black, she'd send them out of the room. She was a racist. She wanted only white women in that space. Um, she called me up to her office. I had no idea why. Uh, what could I have done in, you know, 10 days? And she said, sit down. She said, I understand you're an open lesbian. So I responded by saying, yes, I'm also an open uh, feminist and open Jew. Because I wanted her to know where my head was. And she said, it's come to my attention that you have been touching women's buttockses. So I'm a New York City kid. It took me a second to realize that a buttocks was a toughest and ass, whatever. And, and I looked at her like she was crazy. I, al I literally almost went over the desk and said, how dare you accuse me of something like this? I want those women in this room right now. I want to see who said that, because I haven't been with anybody in 10 years, and I'm certainly not going to start with anybody in here. <laughs> well, you know, and I'm screaming at an officer. I thought I was in a courtroom and forgot that I was actually in prison. So by the time I left her office and went to my bed, which would be, that would be her office, and where you're sitting is where my bed is. The bed was rolled up. I was already moved to another unit called the ghetto, and put in, in a bed called, in a bed, which was part of a physical location that was called the bus stop. So let's pretend that the sleeping unit, 120 women sleep in a unit, could be as much as 150. The sleeping unit starts in this front row and goes back. Where I'm standing is where the bus stop is. And what happens is, in prison, they don't just have one fluorescent light. They have fluorescent lights that go from wall to wall. And it's designed that way to give you a headache. So when the lights would go out at 11 p.m., you all could sleep because it was dark. But I'm right here and it's fluorescent lights, and there's 20 of us, 10 on two bunks. 
and the, you couldn't fall asleep. In addition, right behind me is an ice maker which cracked every crash every 20 minutes from the ice that was coming down. And along either side of me were bathrooms where women were flushing toilets. 120 women were flushing toilets. So it was designed to for you not to be able to sleep. It was punishment. All women work in prison, particularly in federal prison. And if you were over 60, as I was, they would give you a job cleaning toilets or mopping and then allow you to read a book and sit down. Not me. They assigned me, and I was in Alderson, West Virginia, where Martha Stewart was, and it was sometimes called the Cupcake Camp, and that's not true. And people wanting to come back to prison is not true, but I'll get back to it later. I was put on landscaping. I was given a broom, and I had to sweep rocks off the street in 100 degree weather. And I, they knew I had a heart condition. And they still let me stay out there um, doing that. And if I were to stop, they would have sent me to solitary confinement. There's no solitary in Alderson, but they would have sent me to another prison. Um, luckily for me, nine months into my first stay at my first prison, I won my appeal. The Second Circuit of New York turned over I had four in four counts, they turned over my four convictions. Three were for tax evasion, one was for mail fraud. They reversed two completely and they vacated two, which means that the government could come back at me if they wanted to at a later date and take me to court a second time, which they did. Um, I was arrested in 1997. I didn't go to trial for 12 years. The government, if the government has a case that they feel is weak, the thing they want to do is make you spend, make you and your family spend as much money as they can so you go to court and you are forced to plead. And if you have no money, you have to plead. Uh, even if they give you a public defender, that public defender unfortunately doesn't do a very good job. I wouldn't plead. And they were furious that I wouldn't plead. And they threatened me constantly. They take me into small rooms as big as a closet with four guys and say, we'll put you in the worst jail in America. They went after my parents financially. They try to intimidate you until they get that plea. They didn't get it from me. And when they came out, the, um, let me finish one part. When the Second Circuit turned my conviction over, the officer called me and said, let walk get up to my office. It was about 4 o'clock. She said, I've been ordered to release you by 5. You ruined my fucking dinner. She had not a single officer at this prison said to me, congratulations. The women were going nuts, screaming and yelling, because it's very rare to have an immediate release where you get a phone call and you're ordered by the court. And so everybody celebrates because you, that's a miracle, and that gives them hope that maybe it can happen for them. So, Every little crumb that you can find that can keep you alive in prison, you need. Um, so I was out of the free world. I was out in the free world, um, and then I went back to prison the second time. Um, the only thing that you can do in prison that they have no control over is deciding what religion you want to be. So if you want to be Catholic on Monday and Christian on Tuesday and Muslim on Thursday but they can't say no. So, I'm Jewish and we have a holiday called Passover, and six weeks, and that holiday we do not, we eat certain foods, we eat different foods, and we are permitted to order food, like chocolate covered matzah and macaroons, which are things you do not see in prison. So there's about maybe seven Jews on the compound, but miraculously before Passover, six weeks before, 35 people converted, just so everybody could get that form. And they also came to the two nights that we had Seder, but the reason they came for the two nights we had Seder is because there was five hours away from hell with no officers. So they would give us five hours to have our service, and for those five hours, you felt a little human. And when Passover was over, 
it was Ramadan, so everybody converted to be a Muslim because the food was better for that holiday. In both prisons, there was zero medical care. I don't care what anybody tells you. There's, you see a doctor the first day or a nurse, and then what you have on the compound are physician's assistants. So if you um, have a heart attack, if you get cancer, if you get anything wrong, it's a death sentence. And in federal women's prison, what it means is they don't treat you. So that when they see you're just close to dying, they send you to a federal prison called Carswell in Texas, which is the place women go to die. Um, we had one physician's assistant who saw 1,100 women. And whether you had a headache, a broken foot, a cyst, a, cyst, a migraine, he said the same thing to all 1,100 women. You're fat, walk on the track, drink water. There was a woman named Miriam Hernandez, she was one of many, who went to see him and said, I feel like I'm dying. And she looked like she was dying. He gave her the fat speech, and two weeks later, her gallbladder exploded and she was dead. There were many deaths in prison, and it's an untold story. Excuse us. <laughs> um, I think those were my plans, actually. Um, Mary, so when I saw her die, and another friend of mine um, had a problem with her eye, and I, if you know anything about eyes and ears, as soon as you start to have a problem with eyes and ears, if you don't fix it, you lose your sight. A good friend of mine went blind within four days. They refused to take her out, even though they knew that her vision was going. I wrote an article, and instead of snail mailing it, I'm a writer, I wrote up people's cases, I snail mailed them out, they got posted on my website. This time, I didn't snail mail. And in prison, they have dedicated officers in a room that read all your emails. They all, you pay for this, by the way. You pay for them to read our emails. They have dedicated officers to listen to every phone call. And if they think you're saying you're a security risk for any reason, um, they will put you away. So uh, I emailed this, it was posted, and an hour after it was posted, I was shackled, I was thrown into solitary confinement, and told in no uncertain terms that I was there because I offended an officer. But the charge was that I was a security risk. And that's the vague charge that they use uh, pretty much to get everyone. Now, prison is one thing. Solitary confinement, they get paid triple the money so people want to work in, so in solitary. It's very expensive to put a person in solitary. So um, there's four people who run it. They answer to no one. I might have been seen by a jury and I might have been found guilty, and I might have been sent to prison because of that. But in prison, they can do whatever they want, and they do. So, solitary confinement, um, there was uh, 60 women held, and it's not for fighting, it's not for anything dangerous, it's primarily, and particularly in a women's prison, which is very different than a men's prison. A women's prison is held for retaliation. And a lot of it has to do with uh, sexual abuse, sexual harassment. So for example, if you had a child, an officer could come over to you, or I watched this myself, and whisper, if you want to see your kid today, I want a blow job. Now what are you going to do? Some women, I mean most of the women did it because they didn't want to lose their privileges. And then you're in a situation where the officer is nervous because the officer is wondering whether you're going to tell. If you say no to the officer, you're never going to see your kids because they're going to put you in solitary confinement. Or, worse yet, if your kids are 100 miles away and you're in Florida and your kids can get to you, they're going to put you in FCI Dublin in California to make you pay for not having sex with that officer. The amount of sexual violence and sexual harassment is phenomenal in women's prisons. And it's only worse the people who are most at risk besides women, or who are much more at risk, are um, trans women of color who are being held in men's prisons. I would say they are 100% at risk every day. 
And look, that's not me just making this up. This is from interviews and from studies being done. Um, so I was kept in solitary for seven weeks, and to this day, I can tell you, I have not recovered physically, mentally, or emotionally. Even getting from the elevator down, it being a small space, because um, made me nervous. Um, so you get strip search, you get in a t-shirt, shorts, uh, a jumpsuit, a thin blanket, and a sheet. And they keep the temperature below 60 degrees, like 55 degrees. So you have to wear all of your clothes, and your blanket, and your sheet, and you're freezing. And when you ask for a second blanket, they just say no. Now for you to understand solitary a little bit, I want you to imagine going to your bathroom and sitting in your to on your toilet of your home. Not, I don't know how college it, you may have multiple cells, but this is just a single person's bathroom. Now imagine that there's no window to you for you to look from. There's no cell phones, no televisions, no nothing to read, no, nothing in your medicine cabinet, no showers to take, it's just the toilet, so you can sit down or you can stand up. How many of you think you could sit in your bathroom doing nothing by show of hands for 24 hours? No we can't. So when they put 16 year old black children, black young men, in solitary as a protective thing against adults, they are destroying their lives. They will never be normal again. Um, nobody can sit, and if you ever want to try it as an exercise, you can. I don't think you can sit there for a half hour, because your, your mind starts eating it. You don't have to think about it. You're, you're, you know, you're claustrophobic. So for me, what happened is I had migraines, I had um, vertigo, which I never had in my life, and I had high blood pressure. And I asked to see a doctor every day. Two weeks after I was in solitary, they finally took my blood pressure. It was 200 over 100. And I looked at them and I said, well, I'm, you know, I have heart disease on both sides of my family. Isn't it time to take me out to the doctor? And the officer looked at me and said, if you die, we get $75,000 I your life insurance policy. No, I'm not taking you out. Now, this happens in prison, but this is worse in solitary. They give you a roll of toilet paper, and when they run out and you ask for another, they say, wipe yourself. Now, can you imagine? I'm 60 years old. I have physical issues which require me to go to the bathroom, and that officer allowed me to stay one day without toilet paper. It is still an issue in every women's prison in America that getting toilet paper and pads are a problem. It's insanity. Um, with 60 women in the cells, uh, people were screaming constantly, get me the fuck out of here. And they weren't doing it, they were doing it whenever they felt like it. So it was so loud because the prisons are made of cement and metal that you were listening to people lose their mind. I had a cellmate who was 67, and because she was in solitary, she couldn't see her husband. So she was banging her head against the wall until she bled. And I was watching her. Now, if you're trying to stay alive yourself, the last thing you need to do is watch somebody else do that. So many women tried to hang themselves, some successfully. I didn't think about killing myself, but I did think if I didn't wake up tomorrow, that would be just okay with me, because it was too hard. And returning home from prison, or being released from prison, uh, there were many, many days that I just thought, just let me walk in front of this bus, because it's just too hard to start over out here again. And for most of us, being out, being released, um, has been harder than being in prison. And the reason I didn't step in front of that bus is because I had a dog who I loved, and I didn't want to leave her alone. But had she not been with me, I'm not sure what I would have done. So they send you home they, by Greyhound, they give you $30, and for me, I ended up at Port Authority in New York with no one meeting me. It was, it was a horrible experience. I, I was penniless, I was homeless, I had no family that wanted anything to do with me. 
Um, and I didn't have a big family, so it was only one person who didn't want anything to do with me. And I went to Halfway House. Um, and I'm one of 700,000 people that are going, that are released every year, that are going through the experience that I'm going to be explaining to you. Um, I had to move out of the halfway house someplace. I had a social security check of $1,300, so I was forced to move into a shelter. And you can't live very well on paying rent and having a phone and eating on $1,300. But I had a 30-year work history, so I thought I could get a job. Now, I lived in this uh, women's shelter with a dozen women, one bathroom, and no heat. And it was so cold that one woman turned the oven on, which is not so bad, but then she sat next to it and lit a cigarette. And I thought, if I didn't die in prison, I wouldn't die in this stupid, you know, shelter. I went to nonprofit organizations that served formerly incarcerated people, and they offer you a resume, two weeks of training, uh, three job interviews, and the job interviews are, are to um, food services or, or uh, construction, so, uh, and then you're done. So these services, most of us who are formerly incarcerated are very disillusioned with the large nonprofits that serve us because the three things we need are housing and jobs, which they can't give us, and a community, because we come home and we're very isolated. Now once you, once you get arrested, people, even if you have a large network, I had a, I grew up with Holocaust survivors and their kids. I had hundreds of people around me, but they disappear. When you get arrested, people disappear from your life, and the big circle you had gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the longer you're in prison, the fewer people you have. So if you're in prison over five years, the likelihood of you having any family that wants to take you in is zero. So there are some lucky people, but most didn't. I sent out 200 job applications. I had a 30-year work history, which is different than most people. Um, and I got exactly one interview, and I didn't get the job. I couldn't get an entry-level job. So, um, and I understood poverty for the first time. I would make a choice of whether to eat a 30-cent bagel or a dollar piece of pizza. I didn't want either of those things, but those were my only options. So after being homeless for about 16 months, I ran into a friend who got me into low-income housing for seniors. And I said to her, listen, the rent is going to be my social security. What am I going to live on? She said, let's get you stable. She was correct. As soon as I moved into my own apartment, had a key, could lock the door, and be in my own space, I did stabilize. Um, but I couldn't get a job. And when she realized that I couldn't get a job anywhere, even with her help, um, part of the problem was my age. I was 64 at the time, and a convicted felon. So I was too old for most of the market. They wouldn't look at me. 30-year-old person is not going to hire me. Uh, and so what she did is give me $1,000 a month. She said, I'm going to give you $1,000 a month for a year. And you're going to try to make a life. And without that money, I wouldn't be here today. So one person helping me, and one person giving me some money so that I could live to try to build something, is the reason that I am standing here tonight. And everybody needs... I believe that if you help one person a day, then you've done a lot. Because I know from that personal experience. Um, so, now what I'm going to do is tell you some of the things I want you to think about. Um, oh, I was able to form witness to mass incarceration. I was able to build up a reputation. I started testifying at, at, in New York and in Washington in front of the uh, Department of Justice. And I did speak at the White House and when the Obama administration was there. I, it's a nightmare for us now. Um, to do anything. Uh, returning home for 700,000 people is worse than you can understand. In prison, you know you're going to get three meals a day, you know you have to go to work, you know you have to do things. When you come home, everything's different. Everything looks different. 
you can't compete because you, if you were to leave for two years, do you think you'd see technology be the same as it is today, anybody? Would it be the same? So when you're walking out of prison, you've done nothing for two years, you haven't. It, there's no books, there's, there's, there's gangster books and some Daniel Steele books. You're not getting an education in most prisons. You did, but you're reading as much as the library, whatever the library has. So you're walking into a new world. So there's 2.3 million people in prison, 12 million go through our jails, 6 million go through probation. That's 20 million people a year under the justice department. That's a huge number. And there's anywhere from 65 to 100 million, depending on who you read, that have been convicted of a crime in America. So that's one out of every three or one out of every four people. Now, that doesn't mean they went to jail. That means they could have had a misdemeanor. And the 20 million people are multiplied by the families that are impacted, their children and their mothers and their fathers. And I'll also give you a few more statistics. The Williams Institute just did a study. Um, this is the most recent study on the LGBTQ population, which, by the way, when people say there's a disproportionate amount of black and brown people, that's accurate, but they do not and need to say there's a disproportionate number of uh, LGBTQ people as well. 42% of the people inside prison and jail identify as queer. That's a huge number. I didn't think it was that high. 10% of the men. So at 20%, there's roughly 4 million people, and the, I always talk to the gay community, and I say, you know, where's the services? What are you doing? And out of the 700,000, it means 140,000 people who are the least likely to have family have nowhere to go. So where are they? What happens to them? And unfortunately, they disappear. They, you can't find most people. Um, the, and it's particularly hard on, on, again, trans women of color coming out, is they're also dealing with um, a, lot of them be, a lot of women I know being killed. So I started Witness to Mass Incarceration to memorialize the American, the, the system of mass incarceration. My parents, because they were Holocaust survivors, testified for Steven Spielberg's The Showing Institute and because they and 55,000 people testified, um, we, now have, uh, we now have proof that the Holocaust exists. We don't have proof that the Armenian genocide exists. We don't have the same kind of proof that we killed Native Americans. So most of us who are coming out of prison are, take, are recording our statements so that you cannot deny what went on inside. Um, Activists and nonprofits have spent the last 40 years trying to change the system, and they've tweaked, they managed to tweak it. That's not good enough for us, but because in one year that Donald Trump is in charge, he's reversed almost every policy and made things much worse. He is building prisons in Southwest America in different states where they're gathering uh, immigrants. This is a prof this industry will not change until it's not profitable. Now, another problem people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated face is that we're not sympathetic. People don't, uh, the, the law enforcement has messaged to you that we are dangerous people, that you are not safe. So when someone survives a storm, a flood, a hurricane, nobody looks at a survivor of prisons and wants to necessarily well lend a hand. People say, where there's smoke, there's fire, you must have done something to deserve this. So we have one hurdle that almost no other population has. Um, and that's a very tough hurdle. Um, if you know Joseph Goebbels, the, uh, Hitler's propaganda uh, minister said, if you tell a lie if repeatedly, it will become true. And, if, and law enforcement has repeatedly told you we are dangerous and you're the only ones who can keep you safe. Just think about Trump saying that the New York Times is fake news. And the fact is that 30% of America now thinks it's fake news. If you repeat a lie enough, 
And if you see someone repeating and repeating a lie, you know what their strategy is. Now, when I was convicted, I expected to lose my freedom, but I did not expect to have my life be at risk. So I am going to lay out four things for you to think about, one of which is a passion to me, and that is when you're in um, prison, when, if you were in prison this past New Year's, and there was Hurricane Maria, Irma, um, what was the other one, Maria, or if you were incarcerated in Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico, and you had Governor Scott saying, evacuate or die, and you had Governor Scott take 20,000 incarcerated people to fill sandbags so that Miami would be protected and then put them back in prison, well, what you have to remember is he said, evacuate or die except for those of you that are in prison. There is no emergency evacuation policy for any natural disaster, period. Um, which frightens me because I know that male prisons in Beaumont, Texas were never moved and they're still flooded. I know that in Puerto Rico, the 13 prisons are on the rim, are on the, pool, the perimeter of Puerto Rico. They were not, only 10% were moved. So every time there's a hurricane or every time there's bad weather, I worry about, or a fire in California, that what you didn't hear about is that there was a youth facility in that, in the line of that fire, and we don't know to this day if any of the youth were, were let out or were taken out. In Texas, there's no air conditioning. So when Texas hits 100 degrees on the outside, there's no Texas prison with air conditioning, but they're coming under a lot of pressure to, to put it in. It's 120 degrees, and men are cooking to death. This you're supposed to go to prison if you've committed a crime. You're not supposed to have your life at risk. When I went to have a, a friend of mine recently died, her name was Ramona Brand. She was incarcerated 21 years. President Obama like, gave her clemency. And she was out a year and a half and she died of massive heart attack in her sleep um, in her 50s. There are no tests. In, if you're in the free world, you're going to get a stress test to measure your, whether or not you're going to have heart disease. You're going to get um, tests for your prostate. You're going to get checkups to see if you're okay. There's no such thing in prison. We have millions and millions of people that have no testing for any illness. So many people who are coming out of prison are dying young. There's no dental care. I signed up for a teeth cleaning in 2010 and got a note back saying, um, you have you on our list, we're currently seeing people from 2007. So if you don't, gum disease, you can die from. So medical, dental, uh, hurricanes, and the last sexual violence. Um, I just interviewed a gay man in Texas who for 18 months was used as a sex slave from gang to gang, $5 a day is what people pay to have him um, perform sex acts. You don't recover from that. So there's a lot of work to be done. What I'm doing, I have some postcards. I hope you will sign my mailing list. I hope you will write your cell phone numbers because there's prosecutorial elections coming up this uh, November, and I want to text down to everybody you know, who elicit candidates that we're supporting. Um, I have also the suitcase project. I came home alone to nobody. So I started this initiative and I have 20 synagogues and churches working with me. I want to provide, a, have someone meet and greet someone when they're coming out to prison, whether it's the Greyhound or whatever bus station it is. I want them to give them a suitcase with a cell phone, a computer, and items they need, and then I want that synagogue or church, or in some cases, it's student groups, to adopt that the newly released person for one year. And that means just have dinner with them once a month so that they feel included anywhere. So the suitcase project is just starting. Um, so please take a card and uh, keep in touch. I'm 
I think I'll close and let you, I want to tell you that I'm trying to build an army of student advocates, more than I'm trying to build an army of anything else. So please, this is a very important year for elections. Stay in touch with me or stay in touch with someone. So I'm going to close it down and ask questions at this point. Are you? Go ahead. No, don't be shy. You can ask me anything. I know. At 66, I don't give a shit. I'll answer any question you ask. I had to start somewhere. I like the whole, I, I, I am my own marketing department, <laughs> my own sister. I work alone. I, um, I, I've written a couple of grants, but what's happening, because I have a story that's Jewish and because I have a story that's LGBT, I focused on those two communities first, um, because I knew those communities would want to hear the story. I want every, I would like, there's 700,000 people coming out. My hope is to help 50 in the first year. It's not a big, it, I mean, and I'm asking for donations, so if you want to text to my mobile number, I'll take that too. Everything goes to the suitcase project. Everything goes to um, getting the name of someone uh, who we can help. I have people in this community that are already signed up to do the suitcase project. But I'm, if you're willing to help and get me um, other kinds of places, I'm all ears. Anybody want to be an intern or work on any project with me? Welcome. You're welcome to it. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask, you say you've had friends that have been um, in prison. How difficult is it to stay in touch with people that you've met in prison and like become close to? And I like, I mean, I just want to know a little bit more of like what it's like to have like those sort of friendships in prison. It's so painful to leave people behind that uh, I don't have the words. You survive in prison largely because uh, in this really horrible environment, all you have is each other. So, for example, the food is so bad that it's unedible. But we steal food. You, it doesn't, it, you have people who work at the warehouse and you have women who steal four dozen eggs and they put it in a garbage can. Then there's another group that moves it another foot. It takes about 60 people to get four dozen eggs to a room so someone can make them and give them out to us. So there's this barter system. If you can cut hair, I'll buy you coffee. Everybody's a participant, so it's, it's not friends, it's your support system. And then, of course, you need each other to survive. So because um, I'm a writer, um, the Spanish-speaking women would come over to me with an interpreter and get a letter that they really needed to answer, and I would answer it through the interpreter for them, and then the next day I'd find tons of food under my pillow. So, you know everyone's story. You know that um, a woman named Dorothy got an email from her husband saying, don't come home, that I've divorced you, uh, the kids are, you're no longer the mother, and you have no, don't even come into the neighborhood. And you know that Dorothy is potentially suicidal. If somebody would kindly take her, I would appreciate it. So you know Dorothy is suicidal, so everybody on the compound is watching, so Dorothy don't, doesn't commit suicide. There's a woman who had been incarcerated 15 years, and her son was killed in a drive-by shooting, and she wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. We watched her. So it's not like you make this choice to become friends. You survive a horrendous experience together. You try to protect people who you would never be friends with on the outside, as by choice are your friends, and you help each other now. The only people, I, I get food donations from a woman who organizes Whole Foods to give out food. She's formerly incarcerated. Now, as far as people inside, you're devastated. 
I have a friend who's in there. For, but we have one woman is working on clemency. We have another one. We have people all over the country working on the state level. As soon as it became clear to us that Trump, uh, that on the federal level, there was not much we could do, we went to the state level, and people are trying to get people out of prison. Massachusetts passed one of the best, one of the better laws um, just recently, and all of us are working. Um, but the goal is to get everybody out of prison. Now, I had a unique idea, which I'll share for you. It occurred to me that the first state to end solitary confinement was Colorado. And then I remembered Colorado was also the first state to allow marijuana. So what that meant to me was, solitary is a very expensive item. Um, maybe they got enough money for marijuana that they didn't need budget money for uh, that prison line item. So maybe if we got 50 states to be bringing in money for um, marijuana sales, maybe that would replace the money that the states rely on to hold millions of people in prison. Remember, prison is a business, and the ultimate end of prison is only going to happen when we make it unprofitable. Another way to make it unprofitable is to force them to have emergency evacuations of all uh, people inside prison during any natural disaster. So if the state of Florida had to move its 100,000 people, it would cost them $2 billion. And then prison wouldn't be profitable. End of story. So many, I am trying to push the notion. Um, I'm trying to get some people to do some research with me. Um, that if, and policy people to push states into a place where they have to evacuate. Because that will destroy Florida, Texas, Mississippi, the worst states um, in terms of what they do to people. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you've been following in the past year or two years, there have been a couple of major like prison labor strikes. Uh, and then in, in the early part of this year, uh, for the first time, an incarcerated workers organizing committee formed in Florida, a branch of the IWW. I was wondering if you had sort of like followed like like labor organizing within prisons or if that was happening in your prison or if you see like a possibility for that in the future for that and what that might look like. It will never happen in women's prisons. I tried to organize women and they're too scared. And that's kind of a known thing. The men will men will uh, go on hunger strikes in a heartbeat. Men will organize labor units I have hope for the women. Um, I tried to organize them, but there's a rule in prison that if four people are standing together, that's called inciting a riot. And remember, most of the 80% of the people in prison, 80% of the women who are in prison had children. So their primary concern is not to be separated from visitation. So that's the reason. It's not because they don't want to do it, but they don't want to lose access to their kids, even if it's once a year. And that's exactly where they would punish you. Um, people are able to do more actions, like labor actions now. Um, I don't know how many of you realize that in prison we are, if you call for a hotel reservation, we are answering the phone. If you call American Airlines, we're answering the phone. If uh, we make the, um, uh, God, in prison, we probably are the cheapest labor outside of Indonesia because we get paid six cents an hour. So we farm salmon in Oregon. We make the uh, uniforms for the Army, Navy, and military. Uh, we put together boxes for Microsoft and Apple. You're talking, if you knew the list of people that we work for as slave labor, is it six cents or it's 12 cents or it's 25 cents? It's disgusting, and that's a big story that has to come out. We have, prisons have a, a place called Unicor. I'll get back to your question, then. Unicor, which is where we are 411 in the United States. If you call 411, you get someone in prison. And basically, almost every, and we even market. People are in prison for marketing the shit that the prisons are asking us to market to older people and children. The same scripts that I have a friend who's in prison for 25 years for telemarketing, we do telemarketing. 
And they don't care if we sell an older person some piece of junk. But there are women in prison who have 25 years for doing that. Yes, there are more strikes, and the reason is there are more of us now. In the last five years, you've seen a proliferation of formerly incarcerated people who are getting out in front, taking uh, a hard line, and saying, we don't want to tweak the system, we want to, we want to abolish the system. That it's been not good enough. We're being hired in places we were never hired before, and we're people like me are traveling to every college campus they can and every place that will have them talk so that people are aware of how bad it is. So the reason that there are more uh, labor strikes is because we're trying to make it public, we're trying to write it up, and we're trying to give them, put pressure on the wardens not to punish people for having the labor strikes, because that's the problem. It's the retaliation for doing it. I hope I answered your question. You mentioned um, your public defender not being able to do much um, when you were arrested or when you were in court. Do you know if if there's like such a thing as like an organization of public defenders that work towards ending mass incarceration or they target like well, they can't, there's Brooklyn Defenders, Bronx Defenders, Federal Defenders, there are defenders everywhere, but they, are, they have government money, so they cannot work on ending it. They can work on getting people out of prison, but they, people, if you take money from the government, then you have to behave a certain way. I'm about to get my first large grant from the Department of Justice. I'm getting a grant um, to work with the Prison Rape Elimination Act, the National Priya Center, because there's uh, uh, sexual violence is so bad in prisons that, and they have the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed in 2003, and it's now 15 years later, and, and they haven't. The problem hasn't gotten better; it's gotten worse. So they're allowing me to to convene 10 formerly incarcerated LGBTQ people to advise them what to look for. That's a big step and for us to get in the door. But it also means that I have to be careful a little bit. I won't, I don't really care that much, but I, because I'm getting money from them, I can't dish that portion of the government while I'm working with them. It's a fine line. Well, I probably have a position I a woman met me today who had never met me and said to me, what did you do? And I looked at her to be in prison. And I said, that's really not a question that I we're, we're that we as a group don't like to be asked because we don't want violent and nonviolent people to be looked at differently. We all want to be seen as and treated as one. So, what I believe is that there's probably 5% of the population in prison that really can't live with other people. But I don't believe that that means you have to put them in a cold and dingy room, you can give them a good mattress, they can eat well, they just have to be kept from society because they're, they're just dangerous. Everybody else, it's a waste of time to have people in prison. Uh, there's, you know, I proposed to the American Red Cross that we create, instead of putting people in prison, that we offer them the alternative to be trained, those who wanted to, to be trained in emergency uh, rescue. Because we have, with climate change, we have increasing frequency of disasters in this country, and there are a lot of women and men in prison who are firefighters. In fact, 50% of the people who fought the California fires were formerly or incarcerated people. And when there's a fire in, in West Virginia, they go to the prisons to check us out. So you, let's get practical stuff to teach people so that two things are done. They have something they love to do. Um, you have to just create jobs. Most of these people really want to work and be with their families again, but you have to give them a, an education path 
And the problem that we have is everybody's in prison because who is not educated. And it's only because they started putting educated people in prison that people like me said to other women in prison, file a complaint. People are scared. I said, let me write it for you. If you, if you have cancer and they're not treating you, let's file a complaint. So I, I would say that I, uh, it would be an easy thing to get it. anybody out of prison who's done this, from my point of view, get everybody out of prison who's 60 years old, period. Because prisons are physically dangerous. You, they're not taken care of. You're walking on pebbles, you're falling, you're breaking your legs. And for an older person, uh, Bree Williams from USC did great research that prison it does accelerated aging. So if you're 55, you're actually in the body of a 71 year old. And, nurse, and prisons will become nursing homes. There are people in prison who have Alzheimer's. It's nuts. Take older people out. Number one, don't put anybody in prison under the age of 55, no matter what they did. There's got to be another way, because most of the times it's just a stupid decision. There's a wonderful guy named Sean Hopwood, who's now a law professor at Georgetown. And when he was 19, a friend said to him, let's rob a store. He robbed a store. They kept robbing stores. He didn't know why he was doing it. And he was in prison for 12 years. But inside prison, he uh, taught himself the law, and he was the first incarcerated prisoner to plead a case before the United States Supreme Court and won. And he came out of school, became a lawyer, which a lot of people are doing. Um, so we're going to have to do it by age groups, by mental illness. The people who are mentally ill don't belong in prison and they get abused. So you have to break it, unfortunately, down into those kind of categories, otherwise people won't understand it. That's not what I would do. I would immediately um, find an alternative place uh, to educate people, maybe keep them out for a year while they're being educated and seen by social workers and psychologists only, not by uh, prison guards who are untrained and who are power crazy. But I think what you'll manage to do is get low-level drug users, you'll get um, the categories of people, but if you take those out, you'll only have a handful in. And frankly, what you have to understand is a lot of the people that are in for murder are people who were charged in felony murder when they were 17 years old. So they were hanging out five, six people, one person had a gun, they shot someone, the person died, all five of them got the same sentence, even if they didn't know the person had a gun. So you've got lots of people who look like they have a history of violence, but don't. I, one more thing, I met a woman, one thing I have to stop. It's the most, the point of entry at prison is the prosecutor. We, anybody who's been a prosecutor for 20 years needs to go. And we have an election coming up, I can't tell you how important it is. Here's the reason why. I met a 20-year-old woman. Um, in Tennessee, there's nothing to do in her town. There's 3,000 people, there's a general store, a post office, there's no jobs. So they all um, do drugs. Her mother sold drugs. So when they came to arrest her mother, they arrested all 17 members of her family, meaning grandmother, children, brothers, sisters, cousins. They sent them all to prison as if they all did the same thing. You know, they were all guilty of the same count. She was released by Obama, one of the last ones to be released. But they took all the children that were 16 and younger and gave them to foster parents, as if there were no family. They destroyed a family lineage. So another thing to help us break this down is to get prosecutors willing to take a look backwards and open up these cases and say, Let, maybe we should keep the mother in, but get the rest of the family out. Get grandma and the kids and the aunts and the uncles out of prison. So it's tedious work, and it can only be done if we have the right legislators, but more importantly, the right judges and the right prosecutors.
they're leaving prisons and like what they need in those kinds of services? Since I'm a senior, she wants to know what unique needs we have. Um, I walked out of prison physically damaged, you know, sleeping on a metal bed in solitary confinement destroyed my back. Um, being in prison uh, where it's 100 degrees and then you're freezing because you don't have enough clothes in prison to keep you warm. So, my, I'm 66, my body's probably 72. There's nobody prepared for us. There's nobody who currently exists. First of all, when we walk out of prisons, there are three things. Jobs and housing are not available to anybody. We have to be lucky to get them. And the third thing, which is the devastating thing, is the isolation, which is why the suitcase project or anything like that is crucial. If When I came home to nobody, my mental health was in the worst possible shape. So it may not matter whether I have a bad back. If I want to commit suicide, that seems the easier way out. Um, there's no uh, facilities anywhere that I know that deals with formerly incarcerated elderly people. What we do have in New York is RAP, Release Aging Prisons, um, Release Aging Prisoners, there are a lot of people trying to get older people out, but my fear is that, uh, I want to get them out, but we have, don't have an exit strategy for them whatsoever. We're, they don't have family. I have, my mother's 90 years old and she has dementia, she can't help me. I have to visit her. Um, so everybody who's uh, older or who's matured in prison, you know, as a consequence of being in there for 40 years, I mean, a lot of people are in prison from 1970 for pot. If you met these people, you would think, this is insanity. These are just people who smoke pot. They're old, there's no place for them to go. So this is a problem that we don't have a solution for. So the focus is getting them out. But unfortunately, that's why I want to get in interfaith communities to create caring places for people, because I believe that's the place it can be done the best. Because those communities already exist. And I also believe if they'll take one person, they'll take two. And if two's not a problem, they'll take three. And instead of it just being dinner, it'll be, let's find you a bed. I am now three years. I have an apartment. I don't have a bed. I don't have furniture. I sleep on a little couch. But I'm grateful for what I have. And I have, it, it, I, I don't say this a lot because I don't want everybody to feel sorry for me because I don't feel sorry for myself. But we walk out with nothing. You don't have, you don't have money to buy Tylenol. You don't have money to buy toothpaste. You don't have money to buy shampoo. You have nothing. That's why unless we give people something when they come out, they're not only having to deal with walking around the streets where they see LED TVs and they, 40 years ago they saw, you know, big, different kinds of televisions. The unfamiliarity of today's society is traumatic. But you, you the, yes, that's a huge problem. And yes, 20% of the people coming out of prison are going to be in need of help. And this is a massive problem that people don't want to deal with, by the way, which is why I literally get on trains and speak in one place, go on a train and speak in another place, because I want people aware of how huge this problem is. I know you want to ask a question. <laughs> Uh, are you asking what's their drugs in prison, or are you asking how did people recover from drugs? Like, how, how is it for people who you were in prison with um, in terms of their own addiction? Like, was, it, was, it, was, it, was that like, was that really dom like a dominant issue? Well, first of all, you're thrown into prison, um, uh, 
and you have no medication, and you have no drugs. So, you are for, for those people who are drug addicted, they are cold turkey. This not, nobody cares. If they um, suffer from the after effects of not having the drug of choice they have, nobody would care. If they happen to die, nobody would care. There's no methadone clinic in prison. There's no, um, there's no medication. In fact, when you walk in, um, I had eight or nine medications. It was replaced by an aspirin. Uh, so there's no help. Now, there, is, there are drug programs that people can join 18 months prior to their leaving prison. So if you have a 20 year sentence, you're going to have to be drug free for 18 years before you see that, that drug program. Um, and the drug pro program is a nightmare. It's basically um, a snitch program where they get people to stand in front of a room and say what that person has done wrong. It's not a pretty positive, inspirational program. Um, what There are some people who, in federal prison it's harder, in state prison you can sneak in drugs. People are still using drugs in jails because they connect, because guards bring it in. And guards bring it into state prisons. Um, so people are still using, not everybody, but some in federal prison it's much harder. But people would take um, bladder medication if they were drug addicts. Like anything that was a pill that they could break up and snort. But that's mostly, um, I'd say 10% of the people who are actually drug addicted. Um, if they're in prison long enough, they're not going to go back to drugs. Not any of the women I met. However, prison, the, the justice system forces you to go back to the neighborhood where you caught your charge. So if you've been drug free for five years, and you're forced to go back to the neighborhood where you were a drug addict, that presents a problem. So it's the prison system that will keep that going. People try to get their get relocation so they are away from the people that they know and they won't permit it. There's so many it it's set up for you to fail. And by the way, recidivism, when people talk about recidivism, it is bullshit. There's nobody I know that wants to go back to prison. But what happens is, I was on parole for three years. Everybody's on the, I was in prison for two, but on parole for free. Three. That's just so they could make extra money to keep extra staff. Once you've done your time, you should be able to vote. You should be able to enter the world, and you shouldn't have someone staring at you. Um, and ankle monitors are the hardest thing, because that means someone's watching you 24 hour a day. And there's a, uh, Bipartisan effort, but it's really not true. The Koch brothers really would like to have reentry programs because it can be money making for them. They can get judges to give longer parole and probation sentences, and that means they have control over them many years. So, for example, I was in New York City. I was not allowed to go out of Manhattan without calling my probation officer. My mother lived in New Jersey. So there were occasions I forgot to call and ask permission and I was on the bus. And I was very nervous until I got home in the evening. And uh, you forget. And once I, I, a friend asked me to, to drive him to a prison, I didn't ask him where we were in Pennsylvania, and I thought, oh shit, you know what? They'll send me, I'm an agitator to them. In a heartbeat, they'll send me back to prison. So the rules are so strict. Some people can't use a cell phone. A friend of mine was not allowed to use a cell phone and her mother was dying, so her daughter gave her the cell phone to say goodbye to her mother, literally. Um, the officer, pro officer found out. She went back to prison for six months. They don't have to do that. They don't, you know, they don't have to do that. So a lot of recidivism is really violations. And, and, and it's really, you know, on the basis of one person's opinion, how nice or not nice they want to be. One more question? Go ahead. Oh, thank you. This is like a really corny question. I feel like There's no corny questions. But like, what really was the catalyst for you to start being an, ad an advocate for this type of 
like voiceless population really? What really inspired you to do this? Being in prison. Being in solitary. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? This is look, I was an activist. I was a marching in Washington in the 70s. Um, I spent an entire life working on movements. Uh, and quite frankly and honestly, I thought I was a progressive person. I thought I understood things. I didn't know how little I knew until I went into prison. I didn't know if I had a, I assumed that um, I had a good outlook as far as racism. I didn't. I didn't know anything until I went to prison and lived with people and worked with them and worked out issues. And when I saw, uh, people would bring me their cases. And as I read people's cases and realized that 80% of the women who I was in prison with, in federal prison, did nothing. Nothing. Uh, it made me angry. And I really walked out, because I had, I had worked on Wall Street at one time in my life, I could have gotten a job, and I said, no, I'm going to spend whatever time I have left, and as much as I can, uh, I'm this has to change. And I'll tell you honestly, at 66, it's not that easy to travel physically, um, especially because of what happened to my back in prison. But it's not going to stop me because this issue is so big and so deep. Um, you can't understand it unless you're in prison. You can learn something about it that I know it has to be stopped and I know that I, I have the ability to speak. I, you know, I'm a little white, old Jewish lady. People don't expect me to talk about solitary confinement. So audiences, that's how I use my privilege. And, and impact audiences that normally don't hear about this. I go places most people don't. Because I know that looking at me, I don't look like someone they think is in prison. And that is a dis good disconnect. I use that to my advantage. And I really don't want you to leave without signing my mailing list. <laughs> I need, no, I, I, need, I, I don't need to do anything tomorrow, but maybe in a month I'll send you a text. So if you're willing. And one thought. I just um, submitted a panel, if any of you can remember. I submitted a panel to Networks Nation, which is the largest progressive conference. Um, and my name of my panel is the intersection of climate change and mass incarceration. They're voting on it now. So if you would go to Netroots Nation and remember the intersection of climate change and mass incarceration, vote for me. I need about 100 votes to get in. I have 17. All right, so I'm going to give this back to JC to close it out. And I'll hang around if any of you want to come over and have questions. So thank you so much. I learned so much from you. That was truly wonderful. Please come up and sign the list and grab some materials. Have a good night.